episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Shu. This month, we're talking valvular emergencies in the emergency department with Dr. Adam Siegel and Dr. Stephanie Costa. The topic is the August 2022 article for emergency medicine practice. Before we get to that interview, I want to remind you of all the things that are in that publication. Every month, there are cases, there are five things that will change your practice summarized at the end of the article. There are 10 risk management pitfalls related to the subject. And of course, a points and pearls summary at the end of the article. It is literally jam packed with information in addition to all the figures and the images and all of those resources are available to you in print, online at epmedicine.net and in the mobile app. Lots of ways to access the information and to have it bookmarked and readily available to you on your mobile device for your next shift. And now, without any further ado, here are Drs. Siegel and Costa. My name is Adam Siegel. I'm Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at Drexel University. I'm also the Associate Program Director for the Emergency Medicine Residency Program and Director of Research Emergency Medicine at Tower Health Reading Hospital. I'm Stephanie Caston. I'm one of the PGY3 emergency medicine residents at Tower Health Reading Hospital. It's great that you two are here today. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Both of you are authors for the August Emergency Medicine Practice article on acute valvular emergencies, which is really quite an in-depth article. Is there a specific passion among the two of you for valvular emergencies? I have a passion for cardiac disease in particular, and much of our research has focused on acute coronary syndrome, but that has been written about ad nauseum and there's not a lot of good review articles on valvular pathology. And although valvular pathology often does not present nearly as frequently as ACS, when it does present, it is often in, in a dramatic fashion. And so that prompted us to choose this topic. Wonderful. And when we're talking about valvular pathology in the emergency department, what kinds of valvular disease specifically are we talking about? Is this just aortic specific disease or are we are talking about all four valves? So we chose mostly to talk about aortic and mitral valvular diseases because those will present very acutely with cardiovascular collapse. The other two valves are possible presentations to the emergency department but they would be less sick, less dramatic sort of presentations. But the paper will mostly focus on aortic and mitral valves. And when we talk about specifically the aortic valve diseases, what kind of entities are we referring to? So we're mostly talking about uh, aortic stenosis and regurgitation. And the underlying pathology really depends on where you practice. If you're in a developed country, you may see more of the aging population with degenerative and calcified valves. Versus if you're in a developing country, you may see more disease secondary to infectious diseases like rheumatic heart disease. And with the mitral valve diseases? Similar kind of presentations where if you're in a developed country, it's going to be those degenerative and calcified valve diseases. And more developing could be more infectious diseases like rheumatic heart disease. Good. It's one, one trend that we're going to emphasize is there is a chronic presentation and then an acute presentation. And with the stenotic lesions, patients will often go for years until they reach a stage where it's producing symptoms mm -hmm. and they will put them to the emergency department. And with our regurgitant pathologies, it's often a result of a catastrophic sudden event. Mm. So if your patient is in a trauma or has an acute myocardial infarction, that can precipitate a regurgitation event and be very acute in presentation. And when we talk about tricuspid and pulmonic valve diseases, those are less likely to present to the emergency department or just less dramatic and severe in their presentation? Both. So a lot of these, the tricuspid and pulmonic valvular diseases are congenital or secondary to rheumatic disease. So they would show up mostly like heart failure, right-sided heart failure, versus the big cardiovascular collapse. You'd also 
maybe be keyed into this kind of valvular pathology if they had pacemaker leads placed, if they were also in trauma or had a history of radiation or endocarditis. Perfect. We commonly talk about the differential diagnosis for disease processes, and we discuss that really each time that there's a publication in emergency medicine practice or the pediatric emergency medicine practice. Now, the differential diagnosis for acute valvular disease is really quite broad and encompasses multiple other disease entities like acute coronary syndrome, pulmonary embolism, COPD exacerbations, pneumonia. The differential for the multiple types of presentations encompasses mostly pain and shortness of breath, or is there other presentations that we should be aware of and keep in mind? For the chronic stenotic lesions, some of the more common presentations are going to be dyspnea, chest pain, but also heart failure and new onset atrial fibrillation. Syncope is a late finding in some of the stenotic lesions and usually portends a poor outcome. And valvular pathology needs to be kept in mind when working through the differential for these presentations. Because not only do these valvular diseases, they could be exacerbating an underlying condition, but they can also be the result from mm. it. So we just have to make sure that we don't discount a valvular disease and anchor on something like COPD as a patient's presentation. Mm. That's a great point. And then we always discuss what it is that our pre-hospital colleagues can do to assist us in making this diagnosis. So when they're picking up someone and bringing them to the emergency department for one of these acute presentations, what kinds of things can they pick up on in history or presentation that might assist us? So first, just taking a great history about when their symptoms started, what exacerbates or alleviates the symptoms, their normal history. And what other associated symptoms do they have? But in addition to that, a medication list is very helpful. If somebody has aspirin and Plavix on their medication list, you know that they had some prior history of some cardiac issue. And then also, if they've ever had a past heart attack, if they've ever had any sort of catheter-based treatments for their heart or stents placed, or if they have other risk factors like smoking, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, all those are very important to gather early on. One of the key focus of a lot of the pre-hospital EMS for chest pain or dyspnea is to evaluate for the presence of acute coronary syndrome, specifically for STEMI. And most of their training and emphasis is placed on that. And obtaining the 12 lead ECG is important. It begins to be the absence of a lot of the items in the differential help clue you in that maybe we need to move valvular pathology a little higher in the differential. Mm -hmm. But having an ECG with new onset AFib when compared to old ones is important. And also for EMS, their response to therapy can be important. So in the EMS guidelines, they go through how to manage shock, which is stabilization of your patients, your ABCs, every breathing circulation. Also getting an EKG, blood glucose, and starting an IV access with crystalloid fluid. Important to note that if they get worse, after fluid is administered, that fluid should be stopped, but also that may clue into a cardiac pathology of the shock. Good. Yeah, that's a very good point. So their initial evaluation is headed down that chest pain, STEMI pathway, but if they're hypotensive or they're getting fluids and getting worse, then those are alerts that should bring to the forefront that something else might be going on. And then when they finally arrive in the emergency department and we are facing the patient and trying to take a history, what kinds of things would help us reach that diagnosis? So if they have signs of heart failure, syncope, lightheadedness, dyspnea, all those surrounding symptoms that would point you towards something cardiac or pulmonary. And then some specifics would be if you have a new murmur that wasn't there before and they passed out, that could be aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes in with cardiovascular collapse and pulmonary edema, that could be aortic regurgitation, but that'd be more of an acute presentation because the heart hasn't had time to remodel yet to compensate for the backflow of blood. With mitral stenosis, you could see new onset AFib, but you can also see hemoptysis. And mitral regurgitation could be more chronic where they have palpitations and rails, fatigue, but also dyspnea, so a little bit less specific. Excellent. These are the type of patients that after they present and you do your initial exam and stabilization, looking through their medical records is going to be important. 
especially if they've had a prior echocardiogram mm -hmm. to help determine whether they are already a patient with known valvular pathology and are we seeing a progression of it? Or if they have a normal echo in the past and are now presenting with new murmurs, that would be an indication that there's been an acute event. And do we know if it's often the case that the patients have any insight or know that they have this valvular disease before presentation? Do most of our patients tend to know ahead of time, oh yeah, I've been told before I have a murmur or I have valvular disease, or is it often as, just as much a surprise for the patient as it is for us? That's an excellent question. I don't have a definitive answer to it. In my practice, when I mention to patients that I'm hearing a murmur, they'll often tell me, I've had that for years. My doctor says, don't worry about it. So I think just from my own practice over the years that patients are pretty much attuned to their past history, especially if they've had an echo, they're pretty forthcoming and given that information. And then when it comes to the physical exam, there's really quite an excellent table on page six of the article about potential physical exam findings in valvular disease. What kinds of things when we're examining the patient might alert us to a specific valvular etiology for their presentation? The timing of the murmur would probably be the most noticeable. So your aortic stenosis is a late peaking systolic murmur. Your aortic regurge murmur would be early diastolic. Mitral stenosis would be late diastolic. And mitral regurge would be a blowing systolic murmur that you best hear in the axilla. I think the first finding that the clinician wants to parse out is, am I dealing with a diastolic or a systolic murmur? And once you make that determination, then you can determine which valve am I most likely looking into as the etiology. Sometimes hearing the timing of it within that for an untrained ear is very difficult, mm -hmm. but having a good clue as to which valve is involved begins to lead you down the right pathway. And do you think just even the presence of a murmur in a symptomatic patient is probably enough to justify moving forward with a formal echo or bedside ultrasound just to examine that particular valve if the presentation's fitting? Depending on the acuity of the patient, bedside ultrasounds, most emergency physicians are now utilizing for all critically ill patients are putting it on and doing the e-rush exam, for instance. And although looking at valvular pathology is a little bit advanced, it doesn't take much more training to have an idea of, is the left atrium overly enlarged? Am I dealing with someone with, now I'm thinking about chronic regurgitation or does the overall wall of the left ventricle look very thick? Could this patient be having long-standing aortic stenosis? And if you put color flow on and you're seeing this really disorganized blood flow in the ventricle, thinking that maybe aortic regurgitation is coming into play in this patient. And we're not asking the question of what is the valve diameters? Does it meet critical stenosis criteria? These are just slight extensions of questions we're already asking. Many clinicians, I think, are comfortable in saying that the gestalt of the ejection fraction is overall low or there's hypokinesis. And so asking, do the walls in general look thick? And I'm hearing this systolic murmur. Atrial stenosis is really in my differential. I think it's not too far of a stretch. And I would not say it is standard of care by any means for an emergency physician to know this. But for some that are enthusiasts in ultrasound, they may be asking these questions at themselves when they're putting the probe on. I just want to emphasize that it's not standard <laughs> here to get that point sure. across, but I think many emergency physicians in general, for all their critical care patients are throwing the ultrasound on early just to help eliminate items in the differential. That's exactly what I was going to say. Even if we can't tell if the left atrium is dilated or the left ventricle is a little bit thicker, you could know if there's tamponade or not. It would help you rule out those other life-threatening differential diagnoses by just placing the ultrasound on there. And you're going to have to get a formal echo anyway to really get all those valve diameters that your consultants will need. But I think one of the benefits of the early ultrasound would be in eliminating those other items 
in your differential diagnosis, thereby raising the prospect that abdominal pathology may be at play. Fantastic. And when we're talking about moving into diagnostic testing, labs are available to us. Is there really anything as far as lab markers go that's helpful in this scenario, or are we using labs mainly to exclude other diagnoses? The latter. We're using the laboratory values to exclude other items in the differential. BNP may be elevated in heart failure, but when these patients present at heart failure, it's in a dramatic fashion and the diagnosis is not a clinical uncertainty. And then we mentioned ECG before when we talked about our pre-hospital colleagues in the ED when we we're getting our 12 lead. Are there clues that we might see on the ECG that could point us in the direction or help maybe solidify the diagnosis for us? There are clues on the ECG that would lead you to think that there may be some chronic valvular disease, especially mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation along with aortic stenosis. If the patient has longstanding mitral regurgitation, there may be signs of left atrial enlargement. There may also be signs of left ventricular hypertrophy in patients with chronic aortic stenosis. And in patients with left atrial enlargement, they may have atrial fibrillation as well. And helpful to compare, I suppose, to prior ECGs to see if there's been progression of disease. Maybe that might clue us in that something has changed. Yes. Yeah. Especially if previously they were always in a sinus rhythm and now they're in an atrial fibrillation. Many clinicians diagnose atrial fibrillation with RVR, but what they often will make the mistake of doing is not asking the question, why is this patient now in atrial fibrillation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we close the loop a little early there and don't ask the next step. That's an excellent point. How about imaging? Is there anything that might clue us in on chest x-ray that there's a specific valvular problem going on? Yes, x-ray will be your friend here because if this patient is too unstable, they're not going to the CAT scanner. So a lot of the chest x-rays will show pulmonary edema. Interestingly, mitral regurg, you may see unilateral pulmonary edema based off of which way the valve is pumping blood out. You may only get pulmonary edema in one side of the lung. So that would be helpful. And it would also help to rule out if somebody has a pneumonia or other differential diagnoses. Now, you mentioned CT, actually. Sometimes we might obtain CT if we're thinking about pulmonary embolism or something else on the differential diagnosis, but CT specifically isn't going to give us any additional information as far as valvular disease is concerned. Is that correct? Versus something like just a chest x-ray, for example. The only diagnosis that a CT imaging may impact would be that of acute aortic dissection, which may present as it's dissecting more proximally aortic regurgitation. This is often seen in trauma, in which case clues on the chest x-ray of a widened mediastinum may lead you to want to make sure we get the CAT scan imaging and management and timing of that would depend on the stability of the patient. But the CT imaging would come into play in that diagnosis. Great. And then we touched on bedside ultrasound already. So thickened valves is something we might be able to see, but really for most of us, we're looking for things like dilated left ventricle, left atrial enlargement, maybe the presence of tamponade or something else structural causing the presentation, things we can take off our differential. At some point, we progress to formal echocardiography, and that may be in the emergency department or maybe not in the emergency department at this point, if they've gotten admitted to the hospital and are moving on to another clinical setting. Is that right? Yeah. The formal echo is really the diagnostic test in patients who are stable. Not only does it confirm the pathology, but it helps to find which stage a patient is currently experiencing, and that helps guide therapeutic options. And in the article on page eight, there are some excellent figures. So there's figures two through five, which show the echocardiographic presentation or images with color Doppler flow for these different valvular presentations. It's really quite impressive. I take it this is generally beyond the scope of what we're going to be able to pick up at the bedside as emergency physicians, but 
when they're examining the valves on formal echocardiography, they're looking at color Doppler flow and things like valvular size and then other structural changes that are occurring as a result of those valvular abnormalities. Is that right? That's correct. They're also looking at the degree of stenosis for these valves, and they're also able to look at flow patterns through the valves to determine if they've yet reached what cardiology would consider critical mass. Good. And then once again, there's an excellent table there at the end of page seven, just the diagnostic test findings. If you have access to the article and you're listening, that's a table you might want to keep in your back pocket. It lists each of the four valvular abnormalities for aortic and mitral diseases and their ECG findings, chest X-ray findings, and bedside ultrasound findings. When we talk about treatment in the emergency department, obviously, if we highly suspect that they have some kind of valvular pathology and their presentation justifies it, are there things we can do in the emergency department to alleviate more than just symptoms? That question, I think, is very disease-specific. So let's start with aortic stenosis. If we're going down that pathway and we're talking about treatment, what kind of things are at our disposal to help patients? So first we need to determine where they are. Are they in shock and hypotensive? Are they normotensive or are they hypertensive? If they're hypotensive in shock, we should give some fluid boluses. We can start norepinephrine and other vasoactive medications to help the heart pump forward and also treat the other symptoms of pulmonary edema or anything else to help them breathe and pump blood better. It's important to note that if they are hypertensive, you can very cautiously start diuretics and vasodilators, but that's not really, that's not what you should see when you first see aortic stenosis. But when you use diuretics or vasodilators, they will help the heart to be able to push blood forward, which is helpful with congestion overall. So everything has to be used with caution and understanding that these hearts are very preload dependent, so you don't mm -hmm. want to bottom out them out, and you also don't want to exacerbate the symptoms that are already occurring. So when we're talking about them being maybe more sensitive to medications, does that mean we would just start therapy at lower doses if they're hypertensive, maybe not titrated as rapidly as we would for other conditions? Yes, and it's a fine balance between doing slight afterload reduction to improve forward flow and maintaining a mean arterial pressure, especially in stenosis. And so the balance between vasopressors and afterload reduction is very delicate. Yeah, it's also important to note that all of our sources did specifically give recommendations per valve, but we did find that milrodin and dobutamine might be helpful in cardiogenic shock, even in aortic stenosis. So really titrating your vasoactive medications to what your patient is experiencing and their vital signs is really key. And then very frequent reassessment of the patient is also vital. I think that's a good point to re-emphasize in that there's not a lot of studies on best treatment for individual valve pathology, that much of what we discovered was expert opinion on an understanding of the underlying pathophysiology and what cardiology would in general recommend for shock state given there which valve was involved in the major problem, either stenosis or regurgitation. And on page nine, there's a pathway for aortic stenosis interventions based on whether they're hypotensive, normotensive, or hypertensive. Interesting to see in the hypotensive or shock state category, early insertion of a pulmonary artery catheter is actually still in that list. Is that something that's commonly done, if maybe not in the ED, but in the ICU setting for these kinds of patients? There's still information that's helpful from pulmonary artery catheter measurements? You know, I can't answer that question in particular. It's, it's not one that we actually addressed, but I would think that these patients are such a delicate balance that the additional data may help the intensivist balance vasopressors and afterload reduction and preload reduction and fluid balance for these patients. And then for aortic stenosis, the staging and the treatment, now this is once they're progressing well into their course of therapy in the hospital, but 
after they've been identified to have uh, severe aortic stenosis, then our cardiology colleagues are discussing options, everything from valve replacement and less invasive therapies. Is that right? So most of the valvular pathologies, the chronic ones, the atrial, the aortic stenosis, and the mitral stenosis in particular, will eventually need surgical intervention. The medicines are just the temporary management option. And the options available now have changed significantly with the advent of catheter-based interventions. They also will base it on the age of the patient and their life expectancy and the overall morbidity of the patients and their pre-morbid condition as to whether they'd be best candidate for a surgical valve replacement or a transcatheter valve replacement. Hmm. But there were some updated approvals where TAVR can be used in patients with any surgical risk and more low risk patients than even younger patients now. So all these are options to a lot of people. It just is dependent on your cardiology consult and what they feel is best for the patient based off of their, their valve disease, their staging, and their comorbid conditions. All right, good. And when we talk about aortic regurgitation and its acute presentation in the emergency department, is it following the same kind of pathway depending on their shock status or are they hypotensive, normotensive, hypertensive, and are we treating those patients in a similar manner? Most of the patients that we see in the emergency department with an acute presentation of aortic regurgitation are going to need a surgical correction. And our goal in the medical management is temporizing and getting them to an emergent catheterization or emergent open surgical correction. So therein lies the slight difference between that and the aortic stenosis. With regurgitation, your main focus is going to be on that afterload reduction, as well as use of ionotropes and volume management. So the heart is maybe tachycardic to continue to pump blood flow throughout the body. So beta blockers are not as commonly used because that would take away that that drive to do so. And temporizing measures, which we wouldn't do, but you can also, your cardiology consults can do intraaortic balloon pumps, ECMOs, LVADs, anything to get the patient to the OR. But we would just be focused on the afterload reduction and really supporting the patient's vital signs to ensure perfusion. Yeah, so the acute aortic regurgitation patient in shock is really quite critically ill and in need of just resuscitation and a bridge to the OR for for some kind of surgical repair. Okay. And then when we talk about mitral stenosis, so the presentation there is going to be a little different. What kinds of therapies might we consider for our treatment in the ED? Well, one presentation that we talked about earlier was that some of these patients will present a nuance in atrial fibrillation. And it's important to realize that this patient group does not tolerate atrial fibrillation well, that they're truly reliant on the atrial kick and the organized contraction for, for good cardiac output. So having rhythm and rate control, if appropriate, should be carried out with these patients. When we mention rhythm control, do you mean things like electrical cardioversion in the ED? Yes, especially if it can be timed for new onset. And if they are hypotensive and hemodynamically unstable, then electrical cardioversion should be performed. And it's important to just emphasize that they still need all the normal atrial fibrillation considerations like anticoagulation and rate and rhythm control. But if they have a reversible cause or their mitral stenosis can be treated so that the AFib goes away, that's also ideal. Mm -hmm. Good. So sometimes the challenge is just in recognizing that that's the underlying cause of the atrial fibrillation that we're treating in the ED, really. But we might be able to improve their clinical status just by rhythm control if that's an option with the timing. Correct. Now, there's a special section on patients who are presenting in cardiogenic shock. So this is kind of the sickest of the sick for our valvulopathy patients. What kinds of things do we need to keep in mind for this subset in this population? First is to just make sure that you're not viewing things in a vacuum. So when these patients come in, they're sick, but they can have numerous events going on at the same time. They could be having an MI. Along with their cardiogenic shock, they could have just thrown a clot in addition to everything else. It could be an arrhythmia, 
So a lot of those will complicate the picture and complicate the treatment. So you want to still support their blood pressures while trying to understand all the pathologies that could be occurring at this time. So for cardiogenic shock, your ionotropes of choice should be milrinone and dobutamine, where dobutamine is preferred because of a shorter half-life and is eliminated quicker so that if they do get an arrhythmia from it, it'll be eliminated from the body faster. If that's not working, you can also add on vasopressin and norepinephrine. Vasodilators are usually contraindicated in shock unless they are hypertensive, but if your patient's in shock, they're most likely not going to be hypertensive. But if you need that afterload reduction, you may have to reach for vaso vasodilators and use with caution. Your definitive management, though, is still going to be your cardiology friends, your interventional cardiologists. And if you have it, a critical care, like cardiogenic shock mm -hmm. team, is also very helpful to coordinate the care for this patient. One cause of shock in this population is if it's acute mitral regurgitation from either cord tendon rupture or papillary muscle dysfunction from ischemia and an infarction. And these patients are going to need catheter-based intervention, and they often have improved hemodynamics when blood flow is restored. Now, we talked about mitral stenosis and its acute presentation. In mitral regurgitation, are they more likely, to, if they have an acute presentation from a ruptured cordae, for example, to be in cardiogenic shock versus just the AFib RVR presentation we'd see with mitral stenosis? The patients with acute mitral regurgitation often present with acute heart failure as there hasn't been time for cardiac compensation to occur with the increase in volume pushing into the right lung or the right side of the heart. So their presentation is usually more of a concomitant heart failure with the ischemic changes. And it's hard when examining the patient to determine, is this just due to global hypokinesis from the infarction, but the presence of a new murmur in a previously undiagnosed mitral pathology can help clue you in. Mm. So less likely to have an arrhythmia, more likely to be in a shock state or kind of more that classic heart failure scenario, maybe with even some serious hemodynamic instability in that scenario. And they'll benefit more from revascularization than a valve replacement. Great. Another excellent table there at the bottom of page 14. Table three, again, if you have access to the article, is just a summary of vasoactive medications for cardiogenic shock and valvulopathy and details some of the hemodynamic effects of the different vasopressors and inotropic agents at our disposal. A couple of special populations were mentioned in the article, like patients with prosthetic valves. What kinds of things do we need to keep in mind for this subset? So there's two different patient populations, patients with mechanical valves and then patients with bioprosthetic valves. And the complications that you may see from either may be similar or could be different. Mechanical valves tend to have more problems with clot formation, which can then embolize. So if a patient all of a sudden is symptomatic or shows signs of a stroke or a PE, it'd be really important to take a look at that valve, see if there's a clot that came off, see if they're compliant with their anticoagulation, and really also to make sure that that valve is still seated well. With bioprosthetic valves, patients can have stenosis and regurgitation of the valve. So if they're experiencing symptoms that they used to have with their native valve, and now they come back in and they're having dyspnea or orthopnea, other signs that the valve may not be functioning, it's also very important to get a formal echo to really assess if that valve still seated well and make sure it's still functioning well. Much of the regurgitation that occurs in patients with bioprosthetic valves is due to valve leaflet malfunction, mm -hmm. whereas the regurgitation that you'll see in patients with mechanical valves is around the seat of the valve itself leaking around. Mm. Neither of those things sounds like a good thing. <laughs> And ones that we will not be diagnosing on our bedside mm -hmm. after. But interesting to hear that, that the patient might actually recall, hey, this is how I used to feel before I had the new valve placed and now I'm having it again. That might clue us in that, oh, okay, you're having a problem with the valve. So what about anticoagulation? So in a lot of the papers we were reading, there's a big controversy based off of vitamin K antagonists versus DOACs for anticoagulation on these patients because if they're on a 
vitamin K antagonists, they have to go for frequent blood draws and you're monitoring your INRs. And that, that can be tough for a lot of patients. I believe the new guidelines say that as long as it's not a mechanical valve or uh, valvular issues secondary to rheumatic heart disease, the DOACs were non-inferior. So that may open up a lot of freedom to a lot of patients. Oh, good. That's excellent. We're accustomed to seeing the little stipulation when we look up in our drug reference that all of the DOACs are for non-valvular AFib, but it's good to see that the recommendations are starting to catch up and now these drugs might be available to this subset as well. Yeah, the dogma had always been that non-valvular heart disease needed vitamin K antagonist and retrospective studies on real world experience has shown that the DOACs may not be inferior to the vitamin K. So we're waiting for more research in that area. But my suspicion is that the trend is going to be that uh, DOAX will become acceptable. But still in general, just go off of whatever your cardiology department is comfortable with should still be what everybody's using just for everybody's comfort and collaboration. Yeah, and this is not in patients who have valve replacements yet. So we're talking about just people who have valve pathology, maybe expanding the use of the medications in that population. But for those who have mechanical valve replacements, we're still doing the vitamin K antagonist, the warfarin. Yeah. The prosthetic valve population that may be non-inferior would be the bioprosthetics only. Good. And really, when we are examining the patient who presents with an acute arrhythmia because of some kind of decompensation related to their valve, there, there isn't a contraindication to rhythm control or rate control as we would for any other process. We just have to keep in mind that they might be a little bit more sensitive to the medication specific that we use. So if we're going to do a, like a rate control, they might become hypotensive. And so we might need lower doses. And if we're going to do rhythm control in electrical cardioversion, for example, no, no contraindication to that just because it's valvular in origin. Correct. And you would be considering rhythm control for those that are predominantly hemodynamically unstable, in which case you may want to use cardioversion more than some of the medications mm -hmm. because the medication is going to have impact on hemodynamics. Okay, and then the last special population you discussed was pregnant patients, which is always a frightening topic. <laughs> when I think of pregnant patients, I don't like to think about cardiac disease, severe cardiomyopathies, or valvular disease. But if we should find ourselves in that scenario, what kind of things do we need to keep in mind for our pregnant patients? You need to keep in mind that they can have just baseline exacerbation of their underlying conditions. Because if they have mitral stenosis at baseline, they can have more dyspnea, more orthopnea, and decreased exercise tolerance. And that's just from the hemodynamic changes caused by the pregnancy. If they do go into new onset AFib, they need to be treated with heparin and brought into the hospital for further management. And then just overall, everyone panics when you have a pregnant patient that comes in, especially if there's something cardiac in mm -hmm. origin. So it's really important to still not anchor and to... Just understand that also hypertensive emergencies can also present the same where they could look like they're going into heart failure or they could have pulmonary edema. So you still have to catch that, cast that wide net and just be very aware of the fact that they could have multiple things going on or just an exacerbation of their underlying conditions. And just to extend the conversation we were just having on the anticoagulation, it is important to remember that vitamin K antagonists are contraindicated in the pregnant population. So they would require heparin and most of them will require admission until they can be transitioned over to low molecular weight heparin. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the fact that they might have pre-existing valvular disease, the pregnancy may cause their valvular disease to become acutely decompensated. They might have hypertensive disease that predated the pregnancy, but during pregnancy, we also have to keep in mind things like preeclampsia and other things that can raise their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, we have the fact that if they present with an arrhythmia, we're anticoagulating with heparin, we're treating valvular disease plus potentially preeclampsia. And in that setting, when we talk about things like pressors or inotropes, other than, the, other than warfarin, are there other medications we might commonly reach for that are contraindicated in pregnancy? 
And if I'm typically reaching for milrinone or dobutamine or even norepinephrine for somebody in shock, and those things are still okay to use for the pregnant patient. Yes, dobutamine and milrinone are still our choice of medications for cardiogenic shock. And digoxin and the loop diuretics are still our options as well for those that are in heart failure. Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's in, I think it's important in the pregnant population to realize those that have baseline some of the stenotic lesions, the mitral stenosis and the aortic stenosis, they've grown accustomed to increased volume, but the physiologic increase in volume from pregnancy may be enough to make them symptomatic at this mm. point. The 30% volume increase that they'll have just from the pregnancy alone, they'll not have had time to, to compensate for that acute change a relatively acute change in their body physiology. And I'm just curious, the, I will say long-term treatment for our pregnant patients, meaning for as long as they're pregnant, I assume is less surgical and catheter-based treatment and more medical treatment until they can deliver the baby and then see if they're a candidate for something surgical? With the exception of like acute aortic regurgitation, which is almost always an emergent surgical management, the others might need tweaking of their medication regimen till they're able to undergo more definitive mm -hmm. care. Yeah, I think that'd really be a risk versus benefits. Like if the patient is severely unstable, cannot be medically managed, I think that that'd be a conversation between OB and cardiology if there's a way to safely fix that now versus. So for instance, patients that have aortic stenosis that present with dyspnea or syncope have a three to five year increased morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. However, that may not need to be addressed until after the pregnancy. Yeah, hopefully. We, we, we know it requires long-term management, but the immediate time frame, I think we have time to work with. Good. There's a great section on risk management pitfalls for cardiac valve emergencies at the end of the article, and this is included every month. One of the ones I found particularly interesting was the patient has previously had a TAVR, so this isn't going to be a valvular presentation of heart issues. They don't really have to worry about that, but that's not the case. Patients who've had the catheter-based aortic valve replacement can still present with valvular disease. Is that right? Yeah, these are not permanent fixes and that they will degenerate over time. They'll have leakage around the valve replacement. There is the option for patients who have had TAVR to have other in-valve catheter-based procedures again. Oh, okay. And the valve can always become unseated. The, there can always be something that happens where maybe the valve migrated or something else happened. Maybe the patient had a bad infection and it damaged the valve in some way. So just because it was recently fixed doesn't mean that it shouldn't still be evaluated. Mm. Yeah, good to keep in mind for sure. Okay, well, we're at the end of our list of things to discuss. Is there anything we didn't mention? Just that a lot of these opinions or a lot of these advice for managing a lot of these valvular diseases, again, were based off of clinical gestalt and multiple papers that we read. So a good... More expert opinion, yes. consensus, than true recommendations for a specific valve pathology. Mm -hmm. So future studies would be great, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. targeting different valves. But the problem is a lot of these valves don't act in isolation. Mm -hmm. So when you have long, long standing like aortic valve issues, it starts leaking over and they get mitral valve issues. And then you can cause multiple valve issues, multiple heart issues. So I can understand how that would also be difficult because usually these valves, unless it's an acute onset trauma or something like that, don't really happen in isolation. Yeah, that's a good point. Lots of consensus opinion in the guidelines and not necessarily specific to a single valvular etiology. Well, that's it, everyone. So much valuable information. Thank you again to Dr. Siegel and Dr. Costa for sharing their knowledge with us and for authoring the article ebmedicine.net, your source for both emergency medicine practice and pediatric emergency medicine practice. And as always, there is four hours of continuing medical education credit for each one of these articles. So if that's eight hours of CME, you can collect every single month 
And while you're at it, check out the brand new evidence-based urgent care publication. And there it is, just your friendly reminder of all the things available to you with your subscription, ebmedicine.net. Thanks for being a listener. Until next time, be safe, everyone. Thank you.